Okay, awesome. Um, let's get started. So thanks guys for tuning in for this. I know there are 60 of you currently, so that's awesome that the numbers keep on increasing, increasing month on month. Um, just a TLDR, we'll go through everything Epoch 8 today. Um, and then what we'll do is we'll get David, Corey, Antonio, um, and uh, Carl from Grants to talk through their respective processes and what's been happening on their ends. And then what we'll do is we'll open up the stage for an AMA at the end. In terms of POPs for today's attendance, what we'll do is we're going to open up a channel on Discord, a text channel where Alucard will post a POP link where you guys can screenshot and or claim. Um, so make sure you do screenshot as well, just in case you can't claim the, the, um, the POP at that particular time, just so we can retroactively actively reward you for there. So just starting off with a couple of housekeeping rules as usual. Let's keep the questions posted in the Discord. If you've got any questions that you want to ask, please save it. And you, you're willing to, to ask the team directly, please save it to the end. We'll invite you up on the stage. Keep your questions pertaining to DYDX and the ecosystem as a whole. Please refrain from using or speaking about price at all. Um, you'll be banned from the server and kicked from this AMA if so. So here we will, what we'll do, let's start with David. David, if you want to start with everything Epoch 8 and then we'll work through the questions. Great, thanks James. Um, good morning, good afternoon everyone. Um, similar to past uh, Epoch reviews, I'll be just, uh, I'll be going through a number of highlights and milestones over the course of Epoch 8. Um, as usual, we'll be posting a blog post with all of this information uh, if we haven't already. Um, so yeah, just to review some of the, some of the highlights and KPIs. So over the course of Epoch 8, total volume on the DYDX protocol was approximately $63 billion with average daily volume uh, decreasing slightly to uh, $2.3 billion. Um, overall volume was uh, flat um, from the, the prior Epoch. Um, ending open interest increased to 1.03 billion and TVL decreased to 898 million at the end of the epoch. Overall, you know, very strong results given a lot of the market volatility and market decline. We, we continue to see a lot of volume and activity on the protocol, which is encouraging. Um, in terms of rewards, so over the course of epoch gate, there was uh, approximately 9,200 unique wallets that earned uh, 5.8 million DYDX through trading liquidity provider and staking rewards. Um, in total, there's now 49,000 unique wallets that have previously earned DYDX with the retroactive rewards program, uh, trading and liquidity mining rewards. Um, there's currently approximately 22,000 unique wallets that currently hold DYDX. And recently we hit the milestone of 3,000 unique wallets currently holding state DYDX, um, which is uh, an, an exciting milestone. Um, overall, if, if you look at you know the, the number of monthly active traders on the platform, uh, we saw a pretty significant increase relative to the prior three epochs. Um, you know, I think part of that is largely tied to the launch of the iOS app um, in beta and seeing kind of active users uh, participate and, and test out the app and therefore earn rewards, which is really encouraging um, and excited to see a lot of other growth uh, campaigns launched by DYDX Trading and then uh, the foundation to try to increase uh, user growth in, in the protocol more broadly. Um, in terms of the liquidity provider rewards, so uh, there was 40 addresses that were eligible for LP rewards with the majority earned by two market makers. Um, again, this kind of concentration of rewards um, is something that's been consistent uh, for the last few epochs. We have seen a lot more market makers and um, eligible addresses being eligible for these types of rewards since the community voted to decrease um, the threshold to 25 basis points. Um, 
But overall, um, you know, I think this is in particular an area that we've seen a lot of activity on the governance forums, um, a potent, potential way to uh, change the LP rewards formula uh, to make kind of the pool more competitive. Um, in terms of uh, the number of wallets and market makers that were eligible for rewards in ePocket, there was 44 addresses that did more than 25 basis points in maker volume and therefore eligible for rewards um, in Epoch 9. Um, for those kind of following the, the forums, um, earlier this week, uh, Wintermute created, or sorry, late, yeah, over the last few days, Wintermute created a governance thread uh, with a proposal to revise the LP rewards formula uh, with several objectives. The first being to redistribute the rewards in a more equitable manner, uh, manner to incentivize competition. And the second objective was really to incentivize liquidity that is beneficial for uh, the platform uh, over the long run. Um, I think uh, I encourage everyone to check check out that thread. I think it's it's really a, an open book, and it's great to see a lot of market makers and active participants uh, provide uh, feedback and. Uh, some thinking in terms of uh, that that rewards formula. Um, it does seem like there's, uh, based on the threads, some consensus um, kind of evolving. Uh, the first being, you know, uh, introducing maker volume um, to the LP rewards formula, as well as reducing the weight of depth uh, spread and stake DYDX in the calculation of the liquidity provider rewards. Um, again, the, you know, the, the specific variables people are still debating, but effectively it does appear like there will be, um, you know, a vote at some point, uh, you know, in this epoch or next, basically revising, uh, the liquidity provider rewards formula and hopefully making them the pool more competitive and driving sustainable liquidity on the platform. So overall, I think that's a really exciting outcome and, uh, it's great to see, uh, you know, community members really uh, participate in, in very meaningful changes to to the community. Um, in terms of the liquidity staking pool, so at the end of Epoch um, 8, uh, there was 378 million USDC stake to this pool from 724 users, um, uh, of which there's 257 million million USDC, which is active and earning rewards. Um, so far, we've seen five market makers borrow USDC from the staking pool, uh, but we um, uh, still haven't seen a ton of activity and utility of that, that capital. Um, but overall, you know, that, that pool has been relatively flat um, for, since the last epoch, and it's something that we think the community should spend more time thinking about kind of utilization and and some of the incentives that the the, um, the community is is spending on to incentivize uh, under underutilized uh, capital in in that pool. Um, in terms of the safety module, so at the end of Epoch Eight, there was uh, thirty million or so DYDX staked uh, from uh, twenty nine hundred or so users. Um, again, we've seen. Epoch over epoch, this number continued to increase, which is great to see, both in terms of total amount of DYDX and then number of stakers. Um, there's approximately, I think it's 35 or so percent of circulating supply of DYDX, which is currently staked to this pool. And it's great to see, you know, longer term alignments and double digit um, APRs uh, generated for, for stakers to that pool and acting as the ultimate backstop to the protocol. Um, so lastly, on the, the supply side, so a big milestone reached uh, this epoch. Uh, there's now over 10% of the total supply, excluding unearned retroactive rewards, which were transferred to the treasury uh, which are now considered liquid at the end of Epoch 8. Um, you know, for those familiar with the governance process, you know, the long time lock vote requires 10% um, 
uh, quorum to for a proposal to pass. And so it's great to see now, you know, uh, more than 10% of the supply really in the hands of the community, which now has really the ability to make um, any changes to the protocol without, um, you know, it, it investors and or lock tokens participate in, in, in the governance process. So I think that's overall a, a major milestone uh, relative to, to past epochs. Um, lastly, just a few updates on the governance side. So, um, you know, the forums continue to see a lot of uh, activity. I think we've definitely seen the pace and uh, level of engagement significantly increase over the last few weeks. Uh, we saw the community nearly unanimously vote in favor of uh, launching the Guernsey Purpose Truck Trust, uh, contemplated in the legal framework uh, for non-US DAOs that the, the foundation published. Um, it, you know, I think the uh, the grants committee and and Carl can maybe speak more to this, uh, but overall, uh, it's great to see the community rally around uh, a legal wrapper uh, for the grants committee and the trustees and the enforcer uh, to execute a, a purpose trust instrument. Um, so really, you know, great, great to see that and, and definitely a milestone for the community, for the DYDX grants program, and, and frankly, for, for DAOs more, more broadly. Um, other proposals worth mentioning, uh, yesterday, Xenophone Labs uh, created a snapshot pool to revise the traded rewards formula uh, with kind of two key changes. The first is to increase the fee weight parameter um, to 80% up from 67%. And then the second key change is to decrease the open interest weight parameter from 28% to 15%. Uh, voting started uh, a few hours ago on snapshot and will end in uh, approximately four days. Uh, this vote is off chain and binding. Uh, and is based on uh, a lot of the fantastic research that Max Holloway and team put together, uh, kind of substantiating the, this proposal. So for those of you who haven't read that, I highly encourage you to, to check that out. And uh, I think Max and team have really set a new standard for uh, community contributions and community involvement with really driving meaningful changes to, to the program. Um, lastly, a few, few more updates on my side. Um, uh, you know, the, the foundation, uh, a few weeks ago posted an open call for in, endorsed delegates. I think so far we've seen nine endorsed delegates, uh, that have actually completed all the applications and onboarded, which is great to see. Um, you know, again, encourage everyone to check out their applications. And if you're, uh, interested in participating in governance, but don't know where to start, uh, you know, you can always delegate your tokens to endorse delegates who are, you know, individuals, university blockchain clubs and other uh, subject matter experts who are uh, looking to consolidate, uh, you know, voting and or proposal power and, and continue to be active uh, within the community. Um, and then lastly, uh, on the foundation side, uh, we announced earlier this week uh, our plans for an ambassador program. I'm sure there's a bunch of questions there, uh, but effectively, uh, we've been spending a lot of time thinking about how do we organize all of the energy within the community into various boroughs or working groups to support the DAO. Um, you know, at launch, we'll have six uh, boroughs, the analytics borough, the governance borough, the media borough, the risk and, uh, analysis borough, the student borough, and the user onboarding. Um, if you're interested in working with uh, like-minded uh, like-minded individuals, if you're excited about DYDX version four uh, and really want to contribute to the DAO, we, we encourage you to fill out um, the expression of interest form posted on Commonwealth. Um, we're targeting kind of a launch of season zero for a subset of um, ambassadors starting May first. Um, really targeting 10 to 15 ambassadors in kind of the, this trial period. Um, you know, for, for everyone involved, uh, I think we've had over 13 or 1400 applicants in the last three days alone. So, 
overall, it's fantastic to see the level of enthusiasm uh, and excitement for for individuals to get involved in in the program. And we'll be reaching out uh, to um, you know ambassadors uh, that that may be a good fit in, in the next two weeks or so. Um, so those are some of the major updates uh, that I wanted to share overall on the epoch in terms of uh, some some last uh, administrative um, questions. So epoch gate ended on April twelfth uh, at three pm UTC. Uh, the rewards will be claimable on April twentieth um, at uh, twelve pm. Uh, and 13 minutes UTC. Um, so that's seven days after the end of the epoch plus a nine hour delay. Uh, the tokens have been claimed. They can be transferred, staked to the safety module or delegated to DYDX governance. Um, that's all on my side. Thanks, James. Awesome. Thanks, David. You know, an awesome, incredible to hear such great news there. I guess then we can firstly start with, with Mark because I'm aware he may have to, to shoot soon. So quick question, Mark. I know this has been on the, the community's mind for a while, but will users that are currently banned from using the protocol due to location be then free to do so once V4 comes into play? Uh, hey, everyone, and thanks, James. Good question. Um, I, I think it, frankly, really comes down to the fact that we're going to look at the issue like at the time and just make sure that whatever decision we make, it's done in a way that complies with the law. Right. And so we've looked at it right now and we think that it's important for legal reasons that we um, do block certain um, countries from using the exchange. And so, you know, we'll be evaluating it in the same way um, when V4 is launched and making a decision around that. Brilliant. Thank you for that, Mark. Um, and then I guess now opening the, the floor to the trading team, so Antonio and Corey, what's the, the V4 progress now? Is, is it possible for the community to have an, any updates on this? And uh, how, are, how excited are the team for the launch of, v, of V4? Thanks, James. I can take this one. So we are very excited for the launch of V4. This is quite literally our top priority as the company is building out the V4 protocol. It's still in what I would call the late phases of the research phase. Um, so we do have a pretty good idea at a high level at this point of what we're going to build. And we're just kind of fleshing out from a technical architecture perspective exactly the details of what we're going to build. And actually, just uh, this week, we started coding uh, kind of the beginnings of the repository that will make up the V4 protocol. Um, and we're excited to share more info on that before too long. But suffice it to say, it is our top priority on the tech and engineering team right now. And we're making good progress. Awesome. That's great to hear. And then the next question, will you implement more ways to store the collateral? So not solely USDC, but maybe DAI, USDT or something like that? Yeah, this is a really good question. This is something we've been thinking a lot about, especially as it regards to relates to the V4 protocol. Um, we definitely want to support it at some point. I'm not 100% sure yet. This is one of the kind of last things we're working through in the, the late stage, stage architecture if we're going to be supporting multi-collateral on the launch of the V4 protocol. But it is something that we're specking out to at least make it easy to add multi-collateral to the protocol um, before too long, even if it doesn't come out at launch. So definitely hear users that this is a huge product advantage um, and something that we think is important and do want to add to the protocol at some point. Awesome. Thank you for sharing that. And then the next question from the community is how does DYDX view the competitive landscape? Being that multiple other DEXs have potentially increasing market share, how do we view that? How do you view that, sorry? Well, I tweet a lot about this, and I think the most important thing that we all keep in mind is what the goal is here. Our goal is not to become the biggest decentralized exchange. Arguably, we've already done that. I mean, we're pretty close with Uniswap from a trading volume perspective. Our goal really is to become one of the biggest crypto exchanges, period, in the world, whether it's centralized or decentralized. 
So I think if you look at things through that lens, the kind of competitive landscape takes on a much different form versus if you had just kind of confined yourself to thinking about DYDX as just playing in the decentralized exchange space. Um, personally, I am not very worried about any of our decentralized exchange competitors. Um, Uniswap seems to be pretty focused on just spot trading and, and AMMs, whereas we're much more focused on kind of the advanced trading use case with derivatives and you know, targeted at more professional traders. And I don't really think that any of the other derivatives decentralized exchanges are super credible um, as kind of competitors. I'm not saying that there's no way we could potentially lose to them. There certainly is. And we have to continue to execute as a team and as a protocol and as a community. Um, but I think we have a huge head start and I just really believe that we have the best team um, and are building the best possible product and I think are likely to be thinking about this strategy in the right way long term. Um, I think the much bigger probability chance as to how we lose or at least don't achieve our goal of becoming one of the biggest exchanges is we just never really break through to the level uh, of our actual competitors, which I would say or, or argue are the, the big incumbents in the centralized exchanges, obviously Binance, obviously FTX, um, and a couple other exchanges like that. Um, and we're small fish at this point, right? You know, we're currently doing about $2 billion a day of volume through the protocol where FTX is currently at around 15 to 20 billion, I think, and Binance is like a hundred or so. So, uh, the main metric we've been tracking on the team internally, and we look at this in all hands every week. And I kind of want to encourage the community to start thinking more of this way as well is what is our percent market share, not just for decentralized exchanges, but across all exchanges in crypto. And currently, I believe that's about 2% or so. Um, so if we're going to achieve our goals, we need to get that up by at least a factor of 10 plus um, in, in the next couple of years, at least. And that's kind of how I think about the competitive landscape rather than just focusing on our decentralized exchange competitors. Yes, we should. I'm not saying we shouldn't pay attention to them. We absolutely pay attention to our competitors. And if they're doing anything that seems valuable, um, we'll take a deep look at it. And we should absolutely adopt that uh, for ourselves or sort of copy things that are working uh, with some of our competitors that are experimenting perhaps more than we are. Um, but as long as we just maintain a really high level of execution, I'm not super worried about us falling off the pace uh, relative to the competitors on the decentralized exchange side. Awesome. Exciting times. and then. The next question is, is DYDX is, is getting used more and more by crypto Twitter influencers. What are your thoughts on, on purposefully trying to spread more awareness this way from the core team down? Is this a kind of marketing tactic people are focusing on? What are your, what are your thoughts there? Yeah, I, I could take this one. Um, yeah, the short answer is, is absolutely yes. This is something that uh, we think could be a, a larger value driver for us over time. I guess right now uh, we, we do have an affiliate program. So we do talk to various key influencers and onboard them to that program. Uh, we are going to be launching the self-service affiliate program about, call it a few weeks from now. And what that's going to enable is anyone who is betrayer on the platform will be able to generate their own affiliate link. And then from there, they'll be able to uh, obviously share that link with their friends and followers and such. Um, so it's going to be vastly easier for us to onboard um, the long tail of influencers or people who want to spread the word about DYDX and get incentivized to do so. Um, so that's the first thing. The other thing is um, the marketing team here at DYDX is engaging with um, a marketing firm as well as a PR firm here. Um, and so that's going to like the, the work there is probably going to be started in earnest in a few weeks from now as well. And what that's going to enable us is, you know, uh, a lot greater reach from the PR landscape. So seeing DYDX more media, um, across the world and then also conducting more and more campaigns. And this is just digital advertising, but this is also like influencer relationship building. Um, and this is also across various geographies. 
And so uh, we're definitely excited about these partnerships here, and we're going to have a lot more resources to spend on developing them. And then lastly, we're also growing the team internally uh, so we could talk uh, with these influencers more often and you know have better relationship building and management with them. And then lastly, with, in conjunction with the foundation, um, a lot of the community managers that the foundation has been bringing on have a lot of connections to various influencers in the space as well. And so working with them to connect with, you know, various influencers in these key geographies that we're spending a lot of time on uh, is going to be another factor here. And so putting all those things together, I think we're kind of setting ourselves up to be in a really good spot to onboard a lot more, call it influencers, um, and, you know, have that be a core part of the strategy over the next year. Brilliant. Thanks, Corey. That's super exciting. And I guess then the next question, which is more product focused, is is the DYDX app ready for public launch? And can you provide any feedback from how the beta launch went? It is very close, um, probably a few weeks away from the public launch. The beta has been going really, really well. Uh, Maybe Corey can provide a little bit more of the actual metrics here, but I believe uh, around 10,000 invites have been extended to users who signed up for the waitlist for the mobile app, which is kind of the most that uh, test flight allows. We've been getting a huge amount of really good feedback from the community and super appreciate everyone who's given product feedback on the app. We're really excited to share it with everyone soon. Um, kind of our goal with the app and why we're really focusing on it is I think at a very high level, nobody has really nailed the trading experience for crypto on mobile quite yet, even on centralized exchanges, I would argue. Um, certainly, there are a lot of really good desktop trading apps, um, and there are some good apps in crypto uh, like Coinbase, but none of them are really targeted at trading specifically. So we really wanted to create sort of the Robin Hood, if you will, of crypto trading apps. Um, and I think we still have a good amount of ways to, to go to get there. Um, and we'll continue to iteratively improve the app over time. Um, but we do think there's a huge opportunity here. Um, and we are pretty proud, I think, of the product that we've come up with on the mobile side. Um, and I think this is exciting that this is one of the first mobile apps uh, for trading that can be used for DeFi, especially in a more professional way when you're trading derivatives. Um, but we're excited about the mobile app and it should be coming out publicly in the next few weeks. Awesome. That sounds awesome. And then finally, I know V4 is a priority for the YDX trading team, but is there anything else you guys can disclose or anything on the horizon over the next three to six months? Yeah, I'm not sure exactly when we're going to be releasing publicly more of what we're exactly building with V4. Um, we do want some time on the team to just think about it heads down uh, from an architecture perspective and research perspective to make sure that we're just coming out with absolutely what we feel the best uh, technical forward direction for the protocol is before kind of revealing it to the community. Um, we, of course, will be open sursing everything well before launch, um, and we'll be going live uh, with the test nets a bit before launching the mainnet as well. Um, but yeah, nothing to share too much now, but expect something probably in the next, sometime in the next three to six months. I think these kind of really big updates to the protocol do take time to build. I think we've shown just a really good history of being able to execute consistently faster than pretty much any other team, I would argue, um, in crypto or, or DeFi at least. Um, and I think we've also shown that we're willing to make really big, bold bets from a technological perspective. And all I'll say for now is I would expect uh, just a big, bold bet on the technical side as well. And that's really how we're thinking about the technical decisions behind V4. Um, really everything comes back to what is the goal for what we're building at DYDX and we want to build something from the technical side that really has the capacity to grow uh, to the level where we're starting to compete with uh, centralized exchanges more directly. And I think the V4 protocol, uh, it won't be, you know, not every single feature that we want will come out on launch day, 
and we'll continue to iteratively improve it. But I think it will give us an excellent platform to continue to improve exponentially from a product and technical perspective going forwards. Brilliant. Thanks for that update, Antonio. Thanks, Corey, also. Um, moving on then to the, the grants team, Carl's on stage now. So, Carl, would it be possible just to have an update on, on all things grants and of, of what's been happening recently? Hey, everyone. Yeah, absolutely. So we just had our ninth round approved for funding by the committee. Uh, that puts us now at... 55 individual grants approved and over 2 million in pledged funding. So we just hit that milestone of, of over 2 million now in funding that'll be going out. And we have 48 unique grantees now. So we're super excited with the progress. We're still seeing lots of applicants come in. We're going to keep adding new RFPs. We're just, um, yeah, really excited to keep going. And um, we're seeing a lot of grants getting completed, which is awesome as well. Um, we'll be sharing more updates this week. We already shared a couple last week, and uh, we had Chaos complete their CLI tool yesterday, and we'll share additional ones as they come out um, to look for community feedback. We definitely appreciate all the feedback that we get on the grants projects. You know, a large part of it is um, iterative in the sense that we want these projects to grow and evolve based on community feedback, given that it's really based on um, user experience. And uh, yeah, so we'll be sharing additional updates there. We released our new branding, which most people got a chance to see, which is kind of a look into um, the new website that's going to get launched very soon in the next couple of weeks, in the next week or so. Um, so we're really excited about that migration. I think it's going to create a much better user experience for everybody, and we're going to have a place to showcase all the grants, all the grantees, and all the RFPs, and kind of give the the overall experience uh, a great look. Um, yeah. And, and then, you know, in terms of payments, which is something that I've talked about a lot now, um, as our grantees know, we had kind of these agreements go out recently. And that was one of the important steps that we had to take in order to, to move forward. And now we're finally in a good place to get first rounds of payments out uh, this week. And so we'll be, um, yeah, people should start seeing on-chain activity and, and these grants getting funded, uh, which, again, is, is also very exciting, given that we've had people working hard without actually getting their funding yet, which just kind of speaks to the community as well. Um, but now it's time for, for uh, yeah, these grantees to, to get their funding, and, and that way we can see even more work being done. Um, that's, that should be it for me. Brilliant. Thanks, Carl. It's it's awesome to see such high quality uh, grantees leveling up the DYDX ecosystem. So that's incredible. So if any of the community also feel like they, they can provide any value that way, I encourage you to, to get in touch with the team there and or um, interact with a couple of the team on, on Discord to find out more information. I will say now the Poops now live. So if you head into the DYDX general channel and you want to claim your Poop. Then, then please do. It's streamed on Twitch, so you'll need to scan the QR code on there. It'll be live for the next half an hour. So please don't share that link out. It will be only for the 180 in the audience currently. So if you want your PO-OP, the first Epoch 8 PO-OP, then please head to that channel now and, and claim it. Moving on then to the foundation team. So first question, do, do I have a chance of participating in the ambassador program if I do not speak English at a conversational level, but only in writing. Um, James, as the uh, mastermind and architect of the ambassador program, um, I think you're best positioned to, to answer these. Sure, yeah. Thanks, David. I, I guess the answer is yes. I mean, we definitely want ambassadors coming from all walks of life. It doesn't have to be uh, English at a, a fluent level. Um, there'll be you know, plenty of conversations happening in, in written level through the Discord and through the sort of like architecture that we're using through Clarity. So in brief, no, it doesn't restrict your participation in the ambassador program. It might just mean that sort of like doing tasks, etc., might require a little bit of effort from yourself, but no, it won't be restricted to, to just spoken English. Uh, next question. So, David, how does the D how does the DYDX Foundation plan to distribute its top thirty hedges by rarity? 
Um, yeah, so that's a great question. Um, you know, the DYDX Foundation posted a, a blog post on Commonwealth uh, with some ideas on how we plan to distribute the 205 hedges that uh, we've purchased for, uh, from DYDX trading. Um, I think today we've uh, distributed uh, eight or nine um, already to active members of the community, um, and we've published the rationale behind uh, those distributions. Again, um, you know, internally we call this uh, governance mining. In the best way to um, to really earn one of these uh, hedges is is to get active in governance and really display um, you know u- unique participation um, and drive value for the the protocol and ecosystem or community more broadly. Um, and, um, in terms of the, the 30 kind of rarest hedges, uh, basically we've kind of separated those out from the pool, uh, that we, um, are distributing kind of on, on an ongoing basis and really reserving those for, um, you know, really, really exemplary, um, c- community members. Um, again, I think we haven't really landed on, uh, how we plan to distribute those, and certainly, you know, we welcome the community's feedback on what what's appropriate. Um, I know there was one thread on on Commonwealth um, on you know the potential to allocate one one of those hedges to a community member, which like we certainly value and welcome. Uh, but again, given that we only have you know two hundred and five hedges to to distribute. You know, how do we think about uh, distributing the, the rarest ones is really an open question. Uh, but looking forward to working with the community and getting feedback from them on on um, any views on on how that should be done. Awesome. Thanks, David. And then does the DYDX Foundation plan to, to transition its employees over to the DAO eventually? And if so, how early do they expect this to happen? Yeah, um, I think this is a, a fantastic question um, and really a strategic question. I think, you know, in our mind, the the, the DYDX Foundation really has uh, a mandate to accelerate the transition towards community um, control, uh, self sustainability, and uh, really ownership over the the DYDX protocol. You know, I think, you know, if we're successful. Um, and when we're successful, there's a world where, uh, you know, the DYDX Foundation no longer has a purpose. Um, and really, that's when the DYDX DAO is in kind of a, a fully mature state. I think it's still, you know, a while away before that's the case. But, you know, in this kind of interim period, we're certainly building out the, the team uh, at the DYDX Foundation. We have... You know, a dozen or so roles currently posted on our careers page. We're actively trying to hire country leads and community managers in international markets um, to to help us grow on a on a more localized basis and encourage um, you know active community members to apply for those roles if you think you'd be a good fit. Um, but you know, I think at at some point. Um, really, we we envision you know the DYDX DAO to really be kind of the main vehicle for the community to to drive decision making around you know version four of the protocol, and so at some point I think it it really will be in the hands of the community on um, you know who who is employed by the DAO. Uh, you know I think if you look at uh, the legal structure that we've cut. Kind of uh, that that we worked on um, for for the purpose trust, you know that allows effectively a, a DAO to hire full time and part time contractors. And I think our view is that at some point, you know, the DAO will actually employ people globally, and that could include part of the the staff that is currently employed by the DYDX Foundation. Um, but you know, I think that's probably a year, two years, three years away. And right now we're really just focused on building out uh, the team, building out the infrastructure, and then accelerating the maturity of the DYDX DAO uh, to really take control of, of, of V4 once that's launched later this year. Awesome. Thanks, David. And then I guess finally, 
when the, the DAO structure is in place, like how do the team view working groups? Has it been decided on what the current working groups will be, or is this all still in, in process as well? Yeah, I think, again, this is like a fantastic question and really at the heart of, um, you know, how do we make DAOs work? Um, you know, I think the way that I think about it is we currently have you know, call it 25,000 or so DYDX and state DYDX token holders. Um, we have 1,300 people who have applied for the ambassador program. We have a lot of excited community members who want to get involved and participate in some way, shape, or form. And how do we leverage all of that excitement and talent um, and really match that with, like, the functional needs of the protocol? Um, I think... You know, the ambassador program and some of the boroughs that we've kind of envis envisioned and, and communicated is kind of a, you know, I think a first attempt at trying to form working groups and kind of focus on functional areas that we think are critical for, for long-term success of the protocol. But certainly there will be more, um, and that will evolve over time. Um, again, I think that the, the big challenge here is how do you coordinate, you know, global talent and match that with functional need. And I think this is definitely still an, an open area that a lot of participants and DAOs are still really trying to figure out. So I think we view the ambassador program as like an experiment. We're going to learn a lot uh, about what works and what doesn't, and then plan to scale that um, over time um, as we build out kind of the, the infrastructure and the tooling to be able to support uh, kind of that that workflow coordination and payments at, at scale over the long run. Um, I would also say it, it's been great to see a number of community members also receive funding from the DYDX grants program um, to also um, do some research on what this looks like. Um, you know, I think we take a lot of inspiration from what other DAOs uh, have done um, and continue to iterate on that model, but we're still very early in terms of figuring out an optimal structure for DAOs. So if this is an area that you are interested in, um, definitely encourage you to apply for a grant, apply for the ambassador program, or uh, you know, feel free to, to DM me directly and happy to brainstorm about kind of optimal structures um, here that, that may make sense. Brilliant. Thanks, David. Thanks for that. I guess I can also double down on that ambassador program element is that we're really viewing this as like an experiment for working group structures. So again, if that really does interest you and you feel you've got the skills and value that you can provide to the six working groups that we've currently advertised for, then then absolutely apply. And equally, you can reach out to any of us in the DMs on Discord and we can chat further. Okay, so that finishes off the pre-populated questions. This is the time now we'll, we'll open the floor to anyone to ask any questions. If you've got a question to ask, just request to speak and raise your hand, and then I'll bring you on stage. Uh, good evening for all. It was uh, great, Aman. So, and uh, my questions um, were, um, first of all, I want to talk about topic of uh, trading and uh, improving of uh, platform. And uh, I want to ask about... Uh, Isolated margin and uh, problem about uh, wash trading uh, nowadays because uh, I already read uh, a couple articles that uh, you start pay attention for this and uh, uh, start uh, fighting against. And also one of my questions according to trading was uh, uh, about... Uh, Partnerships with uh, such uh, communities like FCMO and uh, different uh, funds, uh, it will be great uh, collaboration, according to my opinion. Okay, so the first question about was about wash trading, and the second question just about a partnership on, on that front. I don't know if, if Corey or, or Antonio, you want to you want to take that. Sure. I think we've released some information about this publicly, um, but we are taking active steps on sort of the centralized order book and centralized matching engine right now, 
to combat wash trading. Um, and anyone who is found out to do wash trading um, will not receive rewards uh, on an ongoing basis. So we are actively combating that. And I think that's especially important, especially when there are obviously quite a lot of incentives through the liquidity mining uh, to be able to trade. Finish it there. Just not oh, this two hands that have gone up. Start well. Let's get him up. Yo, start oh, hey, well. Can you guys hear me? Got you. Loud and clear. Okay, cool, cool. Okay, this is kind of a, a tangential question, and I, I might be, uh, I don't know, it's probably a contentious question, but it's an interesting one, and I, um, it comes from a place of interest in the exchange and uh, the value props of the team and uh, the longevity of everything. In maybe the coming six to nine months, I think we have really good uh, we have really good systems in place that we're building out, and I think the future is awesome. Maybe at the end of 2022, uh, but given the macro environments and uh, just in general, I think that this is maybe at least a, um, an interesting question to posit to the team in a sense, and to maybe uh, discuss a little bit in the community. And it would be: uh, Would the team be open to booting a bonded USDC pool for Epoch rewards? Use with time log DEDX API to combat market sale pressure of DEDX that we're kind of seeing while also protecting the current exchange value per hop. That's probably we can go into more detail if if uh, necessary. David, uh... um, yeah, I, I'm happy to take this. I mean, I, I guess Stoke, well, I'm not I'm not sure I fully grasp like the exact proposal, but like I guess in 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 general, like the community has you know control over the incentive contracts. Okay, uh, I can go into detail a little bit. It's uh, I think it's a good idea, and I know that and there's a lot of honestly, there's people on the team, um, and probably many if not most, if not all, of uh, people on the team that are uh, far more intelligent than I am in some you know great areas. So I'm sure that you know people can find interesting. Um, areas of this to dive into but the idea would basically be opening up a usdc pool that people that, that is bonded so people can say they have a large amount of usdc they can put it into the pool and they can draw a time stick to dead uh, interest or apy off that and then the team can use that usdc pool as basically a, a credit account to uh, pay out epoch rewards and that effectively would remove all, all sale pressure of the dead token and the time locks, uh, Didex could actually unlock around the time of V4, which of course I, I personally think is going to be a, a, a strong catalyst for growth within the whole Didex community. So on the whole, I see it as a, a win-win for the team. It's basically, uh, similar to opening up a credit account and then, you know, paying credit now and then knowing in the future that the, the valuation of the thing you're, you're holding and, and not paying out is going to be worth more than it is currently. And I think it would do. Uh, I think it'd be a great uh, op opportunity for the, the the exchange as a whole, uh, for both community and also to um, maybe better safeguard the valuation of both the, the token uh, from a foundational aspect, and to uh, really set things up for uh, not paying out so much in uh, token valuations at a current state, but waiting until the valuations are maybe uh, viewed far more favorably due to B four uh, uh, changes. So I see some upsides to it, but I, I haven't really seen anybody really, I mean, I'm going to maybe uh, consider going forward with it and talking uh, in governance about it, but I'm kind of interested to see what think people think. Yeah, I mean, yeah, again, so I think, basic, oh, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, yeah, got it. so it's basically like you have a staking pool and you pay out the liquidity mining or at least trading rewards in USDC rather than paying them out in DYDX and then presumably you give like the inflated supply of DYDX to the staking pool. Is that kind of the general idea? Yeah, the, the DYDX would be staked, the API they'd be earning would be staked until about V4 so that there would be a positive, uh, a positive pressure on that, uh, that DYDX at V4. But you know, it, it would be paid out, it would be accrued at this point going to V4, but they would just park the USDC knowing that they're earning that APY even though it's uh, the APY is times date. Which is why it's a bonded USDC pool, basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that is. I think this general idea of like paying out what what token to pay out rewards in, whether that's like the token of the protocol in DYDX, or whether that's some other token uh, or form of value that the protocol acquires, is a reasonable one to consider. Um, so definitely think more about this as kind of a community member and give my thoughts. 
Um, I think we'd have to think a little bit more about the staking pool in terms of whether that's like the optimal way to do it. It seems a little bit complicated to me at first take, but I'll think about it a yeah, little it bit is, more. But I think um, as, a, I as a general... Yeah, I'd be open to talk to Max about this. I think what you guys are, what Max has planned, and I, I, I know that some people have supported it. I think you've talked about it positively. Uh, uh, using USDC kind of as a um, an adjunct is a good idea, but I don't think it went far enough because uh, the premise is that every every epoch uh, addicts is sold, and then people are handed USDC. I think we should go one step farther. Don't sell a didex, accrue that USDC using a bonded staking pool, and then at V4, when there's much more positive pressure on the token and uh, much more demand, I believe, in general for everything going on, uh, I think that, you know, it's going to be a huge, uh, huge, um, a huge moment, uh, kind of like a, a, a milestone for the exchange. It's going to be a really an amazing uh, kind of point that the exchange reaches. I think that's a smart time to be, you know, trying to, I guess, maybe uh, cash in those valuations versus now. You know, you want to play from a, a position of strength. And I think that that's a really strong point to really play from. And I think that people would have interest in taking USDC, knowing that they're, even though that the, the rewards are time unlocked until before, they know that they're going to have something that's worth, I think, a very, uh, worth quite a sum of value, knowing what it, what the exchange is going to be, you know, knowing where it's going, knowing that they're earning it now to enjoy in the future. So I, I see um, a lot of positives, but it's, you know, it's, it's kind of complicated, like you said. Yeah, makes sense. I mean, I think from first principles, um, in terms of considering potentially paying rewards in a different asset or adding in basically what I think you're saying is some sort of like lockup or staking period mm -hmm. um, to when uh, the community actually gets the inflated supply of DYDX is worth considering, um, whether it's through this or something else. Okay, cool, cool. Uh, I'll talk with Max a little bit, and uh, I'll, I welcome governance discussion. I'll try to get that yeah. uh, put, put up on governance in the next few days. And you guys are doing an awesome job, by the way, everybody. Thanks, Tom. Just want to say it's next. Start, well, the, the only other thing I would add is, like, I think, uh, again, the, these pools have been launched, you know, launched eight epochs ago. Um, you know, market structure dynamics have changed over time, and I think... Um, you know, it's great to see very active community members like Wintermute, like Max, like Chaos Labs, among others, really look, um, you know, more thoroughly at the design and um, data that, that's kind of generated over the last eight epochs to make decisions. Again, and any change uh, to any pool is really in the hands of the community. So I think it encourage you to certainly, like, um, think through kind of the, this idea, put together a thread, try to uh, socialize it and get get feedback. And if it's something that the community ultimately likes and advocates for, like really anything is possible. Awesome. Cool. I guess we've just run out of time. I, I think thanks for everyone for tuning in. We had over 192 people listen in. I think it's awesome that this is probably one of the only places where you can hold real frank discussion between core team and community currently. So it's really awesome to see the types of questions that are being formulated. Keep up the comments and interaction. You know, I think one thing that we've said all along is that we're going to be more active on Discord and communicate with as, as many people as we can and being transparent. I guess if there's anything you'd like to see more of, if you think we should change how we run these epochs, um, and that, that could make it more interactive, then, you know, we're open to your thoughts there. And and huge thanks to those who have participated in the, the iOS app and the Ambassador Program launch and pushing out media from that. So let's end on that note. Just if you do want to claim your POP, you have only got another couple of minutes to do so in the DYDX general channel. We'll probably leave it open for another couple of minutes. So please head there and just claim your code. If you can't claim the code, just screenshot it um, and then just DM or open a ticket on Discord and we'll, we'll look to try and answer that. So cool. As usual, we'll decipher this info, post it as soon as we can. Um, there's a process involved in the background where we have to upload the audio and then get it transcribed. So we'll be over the next week or so, and then we'll, we'll put it onto YouTube. So that's everything, guys. Have a great rest of your week.